First of all, I'd like to thank the EAO for inviting me to come and talk to you about 3D printing and where we are in dentistry today with this technology. One of the great things about 3D printing is that you can actually tailor make something for a patient in medicine that will have 100% fit and we're getting close to what you might be able to do in, with individual gene sequencing but then we're going into organs and what we can do with 3D printing is more into hard materials. The second thing is that 3D printing is a lot cheaper and more efficient to build dental bridge, count and bridge work. For a start, you can put a lot of components onto one build platform of various amounts of patients and you can run this all through one build using less materials, so less time, cheaper, less waste. So milling is actually 2019 and now we're into more technologies like 3D printing. And the question you could ask is, why produce waste if all you do is throw it away? Because looking at waste and global warming, we see that's happening. There are presidents of the United States who may say something different, but this slide is definite proof of global warming. We must understand that there's only one thing that is constant in life, and that is change. And it's the same for dentistry as well. And Heraclitus told us this already many centuries ago. And what we are doing now in the change in dentistry is we're incorporating the dental technologies into our everyday work. And we're learning new languages. We have to learn new languages because things are changing. We learned about point clouds. When we make an intraoral scan, we end up with a point cloud. Or our dental laboratory makes a scan of a model or an impression. They come up with a point cloud. And you have to do something with this to make it a surface. And we call that tiling. And we use the standard tessellation language as an approach for that. And by attaching the point clouds together, you can actually make a volume of what you've made the scan out of. And in digital dentistry, tessellation involves connecting the neighbouring dots in the point cloud, forming triangular planes or tiles. And the amount of points influences the degree of accuracy that the digitised image has versus a real object. And when we look into the literature, and this is the Journal of Prosthodontics 2016, they made an overview of materials that we can use in aesthetic dentistry and ceramics. And all of this is based on CAD CAM and on milling. Nothing is based on 3D printing. But there are a lot of technologies out there that you can use for 3D printing, all based on the STL files. And I'll take five of these, put them on this list for you. Digital light processing, fused deposition modeling, jetting techniques, selective laser sintering, and stereolithography. And it works the same as you would do for your milled crown or bridge. You design it, make an STL file, and then you can print it. And this slide shows you a diversity of objects that we use in dentistry that have all been printed, in this case, in a resin. So to digital light processing, what actually happens? We have a light source, we have a mirror, it goes through a lens, ends up in a photopolymer bath, and then we have a lift that takes the build platform out of the photopolymer bath as layer by layer the object is being printed. In fused deposition modelling, we have a string of material that comes out here and gets melted and layer by layer is put on the build platform. Jetting is something that you could compare to, let's say, your jet printer at home. It's got different materials that it can squirt out onto the building platform, and this is then cured, and layer by layer, we build our object. Then we have selective laser sintering. This is more for metals. What it does, you've got a laser that actually burns in onto the powder that you put on the frame. The STL file decides what the design is going to be, and the cam path has been prepared by your computer and now you're actually printing something in metal, for instance, an abutment. So when I look at what we mostly do in dentistry on resin-based materials, you'd have to think about the digital light processing. You've got the several steps that I've already explained. You've got your stage. And what influences the precision of what you make is where you've got your object on the stage. If you've got it in the middle of the stage, the light that goes through the lens comes onto your build platform somewhere and what goes through the sides of the lens could have just a little different frequency than the light that goes through the centre and this then has its uh, effect on the precision of what you're making. The photopolymer, the bath itself, the material that you have in there, what is the batch, what is the lifetime of the material, how old is it, it all has an influence on the quality. This means that continuously you have to calibrate your machine to the material that you're actually using. You've got your light source, your light source has a 
limited lifetime, like the light bulbs at home. And during the lifetime, the light might become a little less. The frequency might change a little bit, and this has its influence on the precision of what you're making. The temperature, the speed of the motor, the software, all has influence on what you're actually making. So all has its influence on the quality of the end product. The nesting, when designing your crown or bridge or whatever material you're making, you have to decide where you want to put it on the build platform and under which angle. And this also has its influence on the precision of the product. This is a little video. Okay. We've done some research in this area with a PhD student of mine, Noel Alarbi. And we've been looking at, for instance, the finishing lines on crowns and bridges. How precise can we make that? And we had a standard die that we used. I'll show you that in the next slide. And we've been printing crowns and we've been looking at the precision of the fit on the finishing lines. This is the die that we used. It's got an anti-rotation in it. It's got the finishing line. It's got the occlusion. And we've been looking at the fit of the lines, but also the fit of where it fits into the crown itself. How much deviation do we have from the original STL file that we used? What I'm showing you here is the support structure. You have to generate support structures to build your 3D printed object on. If you don't, the object is going to be directly onto the platform and you will damage it when you take it off. So you need to have these support structures first. The point is on the crown and the flat part is on the build platform. And you can see that we've tried this in different angulations and we came out that looking at the precision of how it fits on the die itself, we came out with the conclusion that 90 degrees angulation has the highest deviation in the tested material when we compare it to the originally designed crown. So where you put your support is of importance. And this angulation is probably caused because it has more unsupported surfaces which will drop and sag as you take your product out of your resin bath. Then of course could be interesting, are we going to print horizontally or vertically? And we looked at that as well, and it might be logical, but you have to do some research to prove that, is that horizontally built objects are stronger than vertically built because the shear strength of the vertically built are a little less. Then we take it to patients. This is the first patient with a 3D printed crown on a natural tooth that we made. You see there's a fractured Ciconia crown on there. This is what we designed and printed. And here you see it in the patient's mouth. And your first reaction will be, this is very white. I don't like this. This is not the color that we're looking for. But don't forget, this was our first go and we only had one type of material that we could use in patients. And when you look at this slide, you see that we've already made progress in that area and that the color is getting pretty close to what we have in the original colors that we use in dentistry. And this is a 3D printed six unit restoration that one of our postgrads made, Christine Zara. And you can see as you put that into a patient's mouth that you can actually get aesthetically nice temporary crown and bridge work. And this costs Material-wise, something like uh, one and a half euro per unit. So it's not very expensive to make. These are two videos that show the first 3D printed crown that we put into a patient's mouth. Then we looked at zirconia because zirconia is also a material that is often used in dentistry and we were looking at can we 3D print this material and use that in patients. So you see we've made some crowns. The problem is in the process itself. What you see you have a slurry and compared to the uh, DLP printing you do it in the same way. You've got your beamer, you've got your lens, 
you go through that and you harden out the material, but it's all in a green phase. So what has to happen now, it has to be sintered and debonded. And the fluid that is in the material has to be melted out. And when you do that, you get a reduction in the size of the material, somewhere around 20%. And this process takes a lot of time. When we've done this in the 3D printing, it takes at least about five or six hours to get this material all out in the debonding phase. So that makes it less applicable at this time for use in dentistry because it's getting more and more expensive and more difficult to make. So zirconia is not the first choice of material yet in 3D printing in dentistry. But we've managed to show that we could get hesmidomosome formation, etc., onto the material itself, and that does mean that it is very patient friendly. So there is hope that if we can get this debonding procedure to go a lot faster, that we can also start using this in dentistry. So to close off, I'm going to show you a patient that we've treated. This is a, a young lady that needed an implant. We go into the design phase of the implant and directly on top of the implant we've also designed the crown. And this file has then been used to create the drill guide, as you can see here, and to create the 3D printed crown, as you can see here. And then in one treatment phase, the implant is being inserted, as you can see on this slide, and on top of that, the 3D printed crown has been placed as an immediate loading procedure. The next slide is six months down the road. We were in the planning to put a new crown on, but the patient said, I'm that happy with this. I don't want something else. I have a financial problem at the moment, and Let's leave this in for a while. So it's been around now for at least two years. So what have we learnt? We've learnt that dentistry is in a constant and rapid change. And we have to ask ourselves, can we keep up with the change? Can we keep up with the digitalization? Can we keep up with the change going to 3D printing? Or can we even get out in front? We have to understand, create and harness the change because it's coming up at us and we need to keep it in control. We have to be humble because we have to learn new stuff. We have to unlearn things that we thought that we could do that we were very good at. And we have to relearn new technologies. Change is difficult, not changing is fatal. Thank you for your attention and on the bottom you can see pictures of the people that I work with in our department and who've helped develop this 3D printing technology as we use it today. Thank you very much.